eBay friends. I'm Suzanne A. Wells, your hostess, and this is episode number 96 of eBay the Right Way. Today's date is January 18th, 2023, and my guest is Leilani, who lives in Maine. I have a couple of shout outs today before we get started. First is Sherry who recently left this comment on my eyeglasses course in the Premium Library. She said, Hey Suzanne, I actually went to school to be an optometric assistant 45 years ago. I think you did a fantastic job on this eyeglasses course. I have also had glasses all my life, so it's something I feel comfortable working with. So many people, especially men, just want the same thing I had last time when they need new glasses. Then they get told that the frame has been discontinued. eBay to the rescue! Or they break their frames and then find out it has been discontinued. So new parts from eBay. I also like your idea of the ultrasonic cleaner. You're right. Eyeglasses can certainly get grungy. So if you have not taken this course yet, it is in the Things to Sell section of the Premium Library, and it's about 90 minutes long, broken up into several digestible segments. If you have not explored the Premium Library yet, you can still get a free trial. The info is below the podcast. There are now 564 videos that add up to 149 hours of education. And as a member, or if you're on the free trial, you can download anything you want, as much as you want, and keep it forever. And you also get the help desk service where you can email me with your questions, problems, frustrations, rants, whatever it is. And My promise is to answer you within 24 hours, usually much faster. I have another shout out, and this one is to Tama, who sent this email. She said, first off, I have discovered Spotify and I'm working my way through your podcast while driving. You were discussing how sometimes a quick visit to a thrift store or Goodwill could be productive. I was on my way to shop for groceries and Goodwill is next door. (laughs) So yeah, I'd be in there all the time if that was the case. And Tama went on to say, just when I thought there was nothing, a grocery cart was stacked with two sets of plates stuck in the side. I picked one up and there was a hand-painted bird. The comps were amazing and there were seven dinner and five salad plates. Goodwill charged a dollar a plate, so her investment was $12. About three weeks later, they all sold, resulting in $774. (laughs) That would not have happened without you, and it provided a much needed boost. So congratulations to Tama. (laughs) That really is an amazing turnaround. And I love these stories from you guys because they prove that anything is possible and this kind of thing happens every day. Your next big score can be the very next item you see. So when you feel like you're not finding anything, Just keep going, just keep going, and something is going to pop up. Okay, let's get into the chat with Leilani. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to another episode of eBay the Right Way. And we have Leilani with us today. How are you doing this cold morning? (laughs) A little chilly, but doing just fine, thanks. And where are you located? I'm no- located in Northern Maine. Oh, so you got some of that horrible cold weather. Well, we always have horrible cold weather, so it really wasn't much different than normal. 
Okay, so you didn't have anything out of the ordinary as far as temperatures and wind. We had high winds one night and, um, yeah, disrupted some travel if you were not smart enough to be inside. But um, (laughs) other than that, it's pretty normal for us. Yeah, the sun is shining here today in South Carolina. Um, And so after we finish, I am getting out for some thrifting therapy. Oh, sounds good. It's been really cold here. And um, of course, Christmas, we're recording this on December 27th. So everything's back open. Everybody's back to work. Unless you're a teacher like you, Mm -hmm. (laughs) who is uh, not gone back to work yet. But uh, we'll get into that. So um, what's your temperature now? I think it was 18, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, let's get into talking about you. Um, You are located in Maine. That's right. And near what biggest city? Well, we're about three hours north of Bangor. Oh, three hours. So we're at the, we're past the end of route one of, um, not route one, but of the end of 95. Mm -hmm. You, when I-95 ends at one of the points you can enter Canada, you head further north on Route 1 and keep going, and then you get to us. Okay. So would you consider that a rural area? Yes. Okay. Yes, we're pretty okay. rural. All right. Well, we'll talk about how you handle that with uh, sourcing for eBay, but let's start off with how you got into eBay. What, what brought you there? Well, I started on eBay two years ago. Um, I have always thrifted when you have 10 children, that's how you keep them in clothes. And uh-huh. I love yard sailing and um, thrift shops and any free bags of clothes that people give me and so forth. And uh, when we came, we lived in Mexico and Uruguay for 17 years as missionaries. Oh. When we came back and moved to Maine, um, I still you know, was thrifting and so forth, but the kids were starting to grow up and go away. And um, I needed an outlet for um, all my my thrifting habits. So for a long time, I did um, children's clothes and I would bring them home and repair them and wash them and and take them to consignment shops. And um, I also did uh, books through Amazon 20 years ago when it was um, pretty easy access. And, um, yeah, through that just kept alive, you know, the thrifting habit supported it anyway. And then, uh, I have a son-in-law and now my daughter and my youngest son are, um, eBayers and they encouraged me to get going on eBay. And I've really enjoyed that new avenue of, um, shopping and, and selling. Well, you have done outstanding because I keep seeing you pop up on the the money making Mondays just all kinds of items and I would have guessed you've been selling a lot longer than two years well I've been shopping a lot longer than two years (laughs) yeah there's that you have those picking skills (laughs) so let's go back to the 10 children uh, what are their ages, the age range? The oldest is 41 and the youngest is 21. So 10 children in 20 years. Yeah. And actually, I think the oldest just turned 42. I'm, I have a hard time sometimes keeping track. Wow. That is a lot. Um, you have to have some good organizational skills. I think that helps and it keeps me out of trouble. Keeps me busy. Mm-hmm. you're busy keeping them out of trouble. So that keeps you out of trouble. <laughs> I did my best. <laughs> so are any of them still at home? No, they're all scattered abroad. Oh my gosh. Good for you. You have done an amazing job with that. 10 kids. I can't even imagine. Now it's grandkid season and we're enjoying that too. So when you said you had kind of a quiet Christmas, now I get it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we had two. We had two of our children here, 
and one grandchild. So, you know, it was at least there was someone here. Good for you. Okay. So you started selling eBay, kind of transitioning into doing something with what you're buying at thrift stores. <laughs> but you also said that you're a teacher. Yes, I teach Spanish in the local high school here. Oh, how fun. And that comes from living abroad because now, after all that, you are fluent in Spanish. That's right. Oh, that's a great skill to have. And you also teach piano? I teach piano three afternoons a week as well. You are very busy. Good I enjoy you. it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you wouldn't consider yourself retired. Are you a substitute or are you full-time? No, I'm full-time. Yes. Do you have a retirement goal in mind? I'm working on figuring that out, mm -hmm. but I don't have it figured out yet. Okay. Well, you don't have to. No. Um, I was thinking maybe you were going to say you're transitioning into, into eBay full-time, but um, it's hard to give up those teacher benefits, isn't it? It is. And, and I enjoy it. I, you know, I'm happy to be on vacation this week, but by January 3rd, I'm going to be ready to go back and see the kids. Yeah. So it gets I can't imagine boring. not seeing them every day. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> when oh, it comes well, time, I'll be ready, I guess. That's a great attitude. Good for you. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's talk about where you get your items to sell since you are kind of in a rural area. Well, we say rural and it is very, we're surrounded by broccoli, cauliflower and potato fields as <laughs> well as forestry, but um, we do have thrift shops and we do have yard sales for a few months of the year. And so when it's warm and there are yard sales, that's exactly where you're going to find me. That's my favorite way to source because I love meeting people and talking to them and asking them, you know, the history of items and that sort of thing. And then our thrift stores, um, we have a couple of different charity thrift stores and as well as some for profit. And one of our charity stores has um, an outlet. It would be the equivalent of the bins, mm -hmm. kind of, sort of. It's not by the pound, but, but items, clothing items are about a dollar a piece. And um, they're just, you know, thrown out in big gay lords and you have to go through them just like at the bins. Okay. So I, I like digging. Um, when they get too organized, I say, you've taken all the fun out of shopping. I would much rather have to find it myself than have it on a hanger. Um, that's just, you know, my instincts are, I like to trust them without other people seeing it first. Right. Um, but yeah, the thrifting is actually pretty pretty good here the prices are good I find when I go further south even within my state the prices go higher and higher and um, so I like the model of buying low and um, it it pains me to pay up so to speak that is a game changer when you can get things for a dollar mm -hmm. um, it it changes what you choose to resell I'm in that situation now, having moved from Atlanta to Greenville and everything's so much cheaper here. So my whole business model has changed based on that, you know, buying something for a dollar and selling it for 20 over and over again is, is lucrative. So I'm on board with that. Um, so what, are you mostly clothing or will you sell anything? I will sell almost anything. Um, but clothing is certainly where I gravitate towards. It's just easy for me to, to store and to package. Um, I don't mind taking the pictures and the measurements. Um, and I don't even mind cleaning and repairing and try to getting, try getting things ready to, to sell. So I guess with 10 children, you probably have some good repairing skills. Well, I don't know how good they are, but <laughs> I try. <laughs> well, you know, I would think there's a lot of hand-me-downs going on as they grew up. So definitely make things last. Yeah, that's the goal. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about some things that you found and sold. Um, 
maybe surprising or not necessarily your highest dollar items, but um, that's that's what listeners like is, you know, the I didn't think this would sell for that much or I didn't think anybody would buy this. It was just a test. No. <laughs> um, well, my highest item I sold last year, I found at a yard sale. It was um, all leather vintage snowmobile suit. And I knew right away it was it was a good piece and I really wanted it. And I paid thirty five dollars for it, which is really high for me to buy anything. But um, it sold very quickly to actually a museum in Alaska really? and for three hundred and twenty dollars. And it was reasonable to ship um, via FedEx and they were just so happy and excited to receive it. Um, So that was, that was a fun, exciting sale. And that was, that was my highest so far. And that same year I bought a box of um, army stuff, um, just different canvas bags and so forth. And um, the lady told me that it was her son's and it was from the Vietnam era and I didn't know anything about it but part of the fun is buying things and then doing the research and learning about it so I paid twenty dollars for this box of stuff and then bottom I found a helmet and it didn't look like Vietnam to me so I took it to the history teacher at our high school who um, collects things and knows that kind of stuff and he said oh this is a captain's helmet from World War II and So I posted that and it sold, um, I left my driveway and before I got up to the main road, um, it had sold, um, nothing like driving and hearing that ka-ching. And so I paid, (laughs) I mean, when you divide it up, I probably have $5 into it for all Mm -hmm. the stuff that was in that box. And it sold for $233. Nice. So that was, and he, and he too had a collection, a small museum, and it was going into that. So it's just really fun. I, I'm always glad they didn't tell me ahead of time it was going in a museum or I would have felt like I needed to give it to them mm-hmm. <laughs> to help their collection. But um, those were two um, really fun things that happened um, last year in 2021. Well, um, don't feel bad that they paid for it because you were the one that hustled it and got out there and found it. That's true. That's just like a finder's fee. And my guess is museums wouldn't have all the things they have unless um, they're out there in the world looking, looking for items to buy. I think a lot of that goes on, on eBay. I've heard this many times that something went to a a museum or a historical society or something like that. So um, you did some important legwork to even find it. Yes. It, and it's fun. And I wish, uh, I think it would be fun to go to the museum and see my stuff sitting there, Oh yeah. (laughs) but Alaska is far away. So I don't know when that will happen. Maybe one day. Yeah. That's a little far. (laughs) (laughs) Um, This year I've done more clothing and been, um, privilege to find some some pretty neat things just recently I think I posted the gunny sex dresses I've been on the lookout because people always talk about it and I was at an estate sale well she called it an estate sale she was living but she was uh, moving from a big farmhouse into an apartment and I had gotten quite a few things and had a really nice conversation with the lady you know throughout the morning nobody else was there And um, I said, do you mind if I look in the closets? And she said, no, please do. And so I pulled out stuff from the closets and here were these two gunny sex dresses. And so I brought them out. I said, how much do you want for those? And she, oh, those old dresses? How about a dollar each? (gasps) Oh no. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And um, they sold very quickly. I think it was within a week or two, one for $108 and one for 80. And that, and they were both very pleased with their purchases. So that was, that was a fun um, clothing sale, a little bit more fun than jackets, um, although that's where I do the best. 
Were they the prairie style dresses or the prom yes. style? No, they were prairie and they were real thin, like they had been worn, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the fabric was, was not very sturdy. And I disclosed all that, but um, a lot of lace and um, trim, it, they were cute. I, mm -hmm. I would have worn them back in the day, I think. <laughs> well, and that's cottage core. That's a big thing right now. Um, those prairie dresses. I, think, I know it sells, but I don't see anybody wearing them, at least not. That's what there. I was going to say is like, where are people wearing these? Are they working in their garden? Are they sitting around having tea? You know, what are they doing? Because um, maybe it was also for wardrobe, for theater, or something like that. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, you never know where it's going. It's kind of fun to send it on its way. Yeah, and, it is. It is see. like. I found this for you. Enjoy it. One of them, I did know where it was going because she was very concerned that it get there in time. And that was to a lady in Georgia who was going north for a vacation. And I had found um, for one dollar this beautiful, long Angora sweater coat. And it was just lovely. If I, it had been just a tad bigger, I probably would have kept it. <laughs> but um I sold that to her for $190 and um, it arrived the day before she left for vacation. And she was just thrilled that she was going to be warm and beautiful in uh, this lovely uh, long sweater coat. So that was, that was a fun turnaround and fun when you know where it's going and how it's going to be used. You don't always, but it's fun to hear that. Sounds like she might've been going to Narnia. <laughs> yeah and then I um at a barn sale I knew to pick this up it was a Bose speaker system like surround sound I don't know any I electronics bore me and mm -hmm. I use them only because I live in this world but um I paid sixty dollars for this box and came home and just entered numbers my son kind of helped me and we packaged it up because that's the worst of it I think um, packaging big bulky items like that and then it sat in my landing for a long time waiting to be sold but it finally did it sold for 298 dollars and nice. I was never so happy to take that heavy box down the stairs and out the door um, and I think twice now I all because it will bring a profit doesn't mean I need to pick it up. Um, sometimes I, I just pat it and say, somebody else is going to pick you up and sell you. <laughs> and that is an important skill when you're out buying things to resell is knowing what to leave behind, what you're not going to enjoy working with, because it's going to sit there mm -hmm. until you get it listed. And I always have this little mental conversation with myself, like, okay, I'm really not thrilled about that. It, it will bring some money, but if that's in my pile of stuff, it's going to be the last thing I list, which mm -hmm. means it's going to sit there. <laughs> and it's, it's a mental drag mm -hmm. having it around, uh, you know, just, even if it's listed and just sitting and sitting and sitting, it just kind of sucks the energy out of you. Um, and so I'm, I'm getting much better about that. In fact, just this season, um, I have been shopping from my own eBay room, <laughs> from all the things that I have not listed. Um, shopping certainly for gifts, but also instead of sourcing, just saying, nope, you go in there you know, pull thing, five things off the rack and list them and uh, source from your source from yourself. And um, that's been good because as the um, piles get smaller, um, you're more energized and um, it's just freeing in a, in a way that I um, didn't realize how much it was pulling me down just to have so much stuff around. Yeah. And clutter is energetically draining. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all, we all have our inventory, 
but it's about how is it organized? Are you looking at it all the time? Is it just piles of stuff? Is it organized? Can you find that item in 30 seconds when it sells? Um, because getting inventory is never the problem for anybody. It's right. Getting it listed and just managing it. Uh, do you take inventory throughout the year to make sure everything you have is listed? I haven't done that like a full inventory. I've done pieces like I'll go through and are all of these jackets that are hanging here listed and just mm -hmm. do jackets. And I've used learned to use that sort by tool. Um, and that has been very helpful. Um, I haven't yet discovered anything that that has disappeared off, you know, that I thought was listed. But um, it's much better just to get it off the rack and into a package and out the door. And uh, that's what I've been concentrating on this this month. And it's been it's been successful. I've enjoyed it. How many items do you have listed? I have five hundred and ninety seven. Current. That's listings. a lot. I've been hovering around six hundred for a couple of months, and but selling regularly and just you know relisting and and keeping it keeping it right around there. I do have the goal to go through and just pull a bunch of those early things. I look at them. I think, why did I put this up here? And uh, just take those off and and have a big yard sale. I've got a couple of bins. I've started collecting of things that were bad buys or um, sometimes they were good buys at the time. And if I'd listed it right away, it would have been fine, but I waited too long and now it's not a thing anymore. Um, right. Right. That's, so that's, that's important the too. <laughs> is that eBay changes. It's not mm -hmm. that you did anything wrong or maybe when you're new, you're practicing your listing skills and you're, you're listing whatever and practicing your shipping skills and as you move along, your business absolutely evolves into different things based on what you know and what's happening on eBay, what's trending, all that stuff. The rule I, I use is when going through my old inventory is, would I buy this today? Yeah, that's good. And if the answer is no, then after... I usually hang on to things at least a year, give it to give it a chance through every season. But if it's something that, you know, is a, is a bolo that is rare, I'm keeping it. But if it was like, yeah, that trend is over. Nobody's doing that anymore. Or those things aren't selling anymore. Um, that's when I purge some things. And when you purge, do you mostly redonate or? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes and I try to take it to a place I don't shop so yeah. I don't have to see it again <laughs> you know, back before I sold um I would you know clean out the closets and switch seasons and then several times um to my shame I actually rebought things that I had donated <laughs> oh this is this is just my style <laughs> and I'd bring it home and you used mom you used to have one just like that and then I'd realize oh that's mine. <laughs> I just bought it a second time. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I started putting an X on things in black Sharpie, like, so I oh, don't yeah. buy it again because some of these donation centers are, that's just it. It's a donation center and it can be sent out to any store. So mm -hmm. it could show up in front of me again. And I've done the same thing. I bet a lot of resellers have, you know, like, well, obviously my taste didn't change because I had this for five years and I don't need it. And then I bought it again. So at least I'm consistent. <laughs> but do you have any other sales you want to talk about? Um, one, one that I enjoyed again, buying low is, is always the best. And um, there was, I found a sealed um, PSP Spider-Man game, right? Mm -hmm. When the spider newest Spider-Man movie came out. I know nothing about this stuff, but I knew it was a sealed game. And I had heard talk at the high school about the Spider-Man movie. And uh, it was in the box of children's books that were 10 cents a piece. And so I pointed it out 
at the arts, I said, is this 10 cents too? I got it out of this box. Oh yeah, you can have for 10 cents. So I paid 10 cents for it and sold it for $80. Um, so that's, that's always fun when a quick turnaround like that from, from 10 cents to $80, you can't go wrong. No. I, and I bet being around all those high school kids, you pick up on a lot. I try to, I, you know, I never before have watched what people wear and been concerned about it, but now I do. And sometimes I'll tease them because they all know I, I, uh, you know, do this on the side and, and I'll tease them. Hey, when you're done with that sweatshirt, give it to me. I'll, I'll sell it. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I could sell that. No, I just bought it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, and a lot of uh, clothing, retro clothing is coming back. Um, stuff that teenagers wear, Champion, some of the older stuff, mm -hmm. and Ocean Pacific, and the true vintage stuff that from the 80s, not the, they call it retro style, where they make a copy of it to look vintage. Yeah, that's, that's hard. You got to be careful that you're not buying something new that just was made in the old style. Yeah, it just looks old. Well, usually you can tell by where it's made on the tag. The older stuff may not have been made in China. Mm -hmm. you know, everything kind of moved around for a while there where the production centers were, but um, made it. But even stuff made in China can be profitable. You just have to know that category and know what's going on with it. That's true. Because the I I am learning very much to feel um, the fabrics and so forth so that I can source a lot quicker. If things are on hangers, um, just going through and just pulling out the things that feel like they're better made or better quality mm -hmm. fabric. And, um, and then if it's stylish, uh, something that's selling, I don't care if it's, um, you know, a brand that's not high end because somebody will like it if it looks like what they are wearing now. Um, I'll, I'll pull things. And I used to be kind of snobbish about that, but I have sold a lot of Wrangler jeans just because they're the right, they're big sizes or, you know, something about them made them um, desirable to someone who was shopping. And why not? It doesn't have to all be high end. Do you have any bullet points for selling jeans, like certain things you look for? Um, well, up here, I find a lot of lined jeans, like the flannel and fleece lined um, Carhartt jeans. Carhartt's good to me. That's probably my, my highest selling um, brand. Um, find a lot of it up here. And um, the cargo, for a while anyway, the cargo style jeans were, were selling really well. I um, I've sold quite a few women's jeans and I don't know anything about women's jeans because I don't wear jeans, mm -hmm. but um, if it feels good and it looks like it would look good on somebody, I'll, I'll pick them up. And I remember when I first started with eBay, I listened to someone who said, oh, I never sell women's jeans. They always return them. And I have not had one pair of women's jeans returned. So I think just taking good measurements and and picking styles that are flattering, I think mm -hmm. is um, one of the, the keys in women's jeans. And then for men that are sturdy um, or big sizes, I, I do um, pick up things that are, you know, 4X and 3X and um, things like that, because a lot of those people are, are looking online to, to purchase. And a lot of times those will go in lots. I'll mm -hmm. sell two or three, the exact same pair of jeans or um, khakis or what have you, because they just, especially men, I just, I like this. I want, you know, more than one pair. So I have to do the laundry every night and <laughs> I'll buy that whole lot. Do you think the men's jeans are more functional and the women's jeans are more fashionable I probably overall, and again, more than fashion for women, I feel like flattering. So if there's some spandex in it, mm -hmm. if there's, um, you know, an extra wide inside band that 
is kind of a tummy tucker or a, mm-hmm. it's going to stay up. Um, that kind of thing I find um, sells better for me more than flashy stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it's also what I find here. We're not very flashy dressers up here. Um, well, I found some of the flannel line jeans and, and sold those over the years. Um, if I see if I see that and it jumps out at me, um, I'll look further. Like LL Bean, mm-hmm. that's a brand that lasts forever. Yeah, and that's probably my second largest selling brand would be LL Bean. Mm-hmm. We do find that a lot up here. Well, that's headquartered in your state, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. the southern part of the state. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so you probably find more of that. So shipping men's jeans 4X, that's not going to be a padded flat rate mailer. That's going to be a box or a Tyvek, right? Well, it depends on how many pairs and how thick they are. I'm pretty good at rolling really tightly (laughs) and stuffing it in. Um, Women's jeans, mostly I put in a flat rate envelope. and that seems to work pretty well. Um, men's, sometimes it depends on how thick they are, but sometimes I can get men's jeans, sometimes in a legal size, flat rate envelope mm-hmm. um, with a little bit of reinforcement, you know, taking Wait, on so the, the cardboard one. The cardboard ones, yeah. yeah. People forget about those, the legal size, because that gives you a couple more inches, mm-hmm. like and three so, more inches yeah. in length. And you can, you can put anything in there, that fit that makes sense right and that fits so it's not just for documents but um sometimes the post offices have those or you would need to order them online but um it's the legal size cardboard flat rate Mm -hmm. they don't have a padded in the right no so that's a good tip because people do forget about those And then um, I'm very friendly with my post office and um, I often thank them for being my coworkers. Uh They do such a good job of, um, you know, scanning everything in. I've had no, no real issues from this end. And so one day um, they got a big order of, I'm terrible at measurements, but great big um, padded envelopes they're not flat rate but they're they're large and they said do you want some of these and so I do um, that my jackets fit in beautifully um, to those and that means I'm going to play pay priority rate but I'm not having to provide the bag and you don't realize how quickly that can add up when you have to buy your you know, all your supplies. So if the post office will give me the supplies, why wouldn't I use, use that? And those are really nice to have. So was that a post office product or was it just something blank that they It's got? a priority. Um, I'll, I'll show you. I know that. But... Okay. Does it have any information on there? So it that is look it up? 14 by 19 padded priority mailer okay so it's not a flat rate but it's not flat rate mailer that's bigger yes I was not aware of that either and I used to stuff yeah I (laughs) used to um often have to put jackets I would for the best rate would be like in a medium box and just really stuff them in there but that's you know more money than if it's in a uh, one of these typically depends on where it's going but yeah um those bubble mailers are like, that's my go-to, even though it's closed and it doesn't really need to be padded. But again, if it's going to be priority anyway, get that from the post office. Um, everybody has their own philosophy on, on how to do all this, but, um, you know, some people put boxes inside those padded mailers, right? Like the, uh, the padded flat rate. There's Mm -hmm. a, yeah, I've done that that for collectibles and that kind of thing yeah. sometimes yeah there's special boxes that are the exact size that fit in there so yeah that's been going on for many years yeah <laughs> but you know the objective is to make it as inexpensive for the buyer and also if you're offering it cheaper than your competitor who hasn't figured that out like they just put everything in a box and they charge you this price um but if you think it through, 
and try to make it as light as possible without compromising the integrity of what's in there. Right. <laughs> so, right. okay. Well, um, let's talk about some things you've shipped since we're talking about shipping supplies. Um, what was your biggest challenge? Um, the hardest thing you've ever shipped? Um, well, probably that, that bows, um, mm -hmm. but, but I did have help on that. So I, I won't count that. Um, I love breakables as far as looking at them and mm -hmm. sourcing them and mm -hmm. collecting them myself. Um, but I, I just get really nervous when I have to package them. I've only had, I think two, I, I can only think of one, but I think maybe there was another one. Um, things break and had to refund, um, the buyer. And that was sad. And I thought I had done a good job that you just sometimes don't know. Right. Um, so, so breakables certainly are, are a huge challenge. Um, I, yeah, I, I think that's probably why I stick with clothes because I know what to do. <laughs> I know how to do that. Shoes sometimes can be, um, I've, um, a lot of times I can just put them in a padded flat rate, but sometimes they have, I, I found a pair of Fendi stilettos that were very beaded. They were beautiful shoes. I would never wear them myself, but um, they were gorgeous and they fit in that padded fat rate, flat rate. Um, but I was too afraid that the heel would break off or some of the beading would um, be damaged. So I um, had to take a little bit of extra care for packaging those and was happy to hear that they arrived um, safely. Yeah, I wouldn't put any spiky heels in a padded flat rate. No. <laughs> That's not going to end well. And really, you have to think about if if this package was on the bottom of one of those bins, mm -hmm. those big rolling bins, how would that how's that going to work? So think about, you know, if it has 300 pounds of stuff on top of it, is that going to be OK for that item? That's why I don't like the putting the box inside the padded flat rate. I just unless it's a really thick box, I just. I'm not feeling good about that. I've never felt good about that. There was probably, I don't know, maybe 2008, 2010, there was all this stuff going on about shipping coffee mugs like that. And oh. I know some people do it and it works out fine, but I was just, I was just like, I'm not real confident about that, making it, <laughs> especially if you don't fill in the void, the middle of the coffee mug with something, because that's how hollow things get broken is there's nothing inside to provide that counter pressure. And then all these packages get put on top of them. And it's, it's not just, you know, wrap it up and throw it down the stairs and see if it breaks. No, it's going to have hundreds of pounds of mail on top of it. So you got to think about that. <laughs> that's a scary prospect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Um, okay. So what about your, your husband? Is he on board with this? Does he help you? He does not help me, but he's, <laughs> but he's happy to uh, let things accumulate. And, um, I took over the guest room and that's fine with him. And he is very, uh, he rejoices with me when I say, look what I, you know, sold for this month. Why do people pay that much? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's usually his answer. Um, but he's, he's very supportive and I appreciate, I appreciate that. So I don't know if he'll ever be on board, like to actually do it. He's, he has other talents and skills. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll let him do his thing and I'll do mine. Well, and it's kind of nice to have your own thing. Yeah. You know, just, you're just working along doing your thing and um, but that, why do people buy this? I still ask that. I, I'm still surprised every time, you know, I do the research and I price it based on previous sales and current asking prices. And it's still, I just want to ask every customer, explain to me why you paid that much. And sometimes <laughs> they don't even know. They're like, oh, you know, my mom had one of these and I'm going to get it, um, another one for her 80th birthday. And, you know, there's, 
there's no price limit. The sky's the limit. They're going to pay whatever it costs. Yeah, I think sometimes what what hinders me is I tend to I'm more of a buyer than a seller. I've thrifted for myself for so long, and I know I wouldn't pay that for. Mm-hmm. And I and and so then when I'm pricing, I think oh you know, I wouldn't pay that much. Maybe I should come down where my son prices to the moon and gets it. I mean, he gets such good um, prices for his things and, but he never really had to shop to, to stay closed, you know? And so I need to, I'm, I'm getting better, but I am looking at things and seeing what other people have sold, you know, comparing and, just saying, well, they can, I always have offers open and mm-hmm. I sell probably the, well, the majority of my things I do sell, you know, through best offer or um, buyer, either the buyer sends one or I, and, and we'll negotiate back and forth a little bit. You know, I have, I have something in mind that I don't want it to go below, mm-hmm. but um, I enjoy the interaction of, of that. And that's part of the yard sailing too, you know, the back and forth that's, that's fun to me. And that's part of the barter system and the bargaining that you have in, in third world countries, which I'm used to. So I think that's why, um, you know, I tend to, to enjoy that aspect of it. Okay. So the negotiating is a skill that you learned along the way. I probably have more to learn, but I, I enjoy that. I, I, more than negotiation, I enjoy the interaction. Okay. Um, and I'm not afraid, even at a at a thrift store, to say, you know, you have 15 on this. Really, you think, you know, can if I get to give you 10 right now, would you take it? And sometimes, if you talk to the right person, you can can get them down. And uh, I'm always happy to to do that. That's anything in life is getting the right person. You know, if you go to a government office or you're you're fighting a battle to do something with a big company, it's they can do anything. You know, the, the front line says, oh, we can't do that. It's our policy. We don't do that. But if you get to the right person that can and will, um, you know, I, I just sort of glaze over when I get those scripted responses of like, it's our policy. We don't do that. And it's like, no, because I've been that on that side of it where there's always a way to do anything you just have to <laughs> get to the right person <laughs> and that's true at yard sales too sometimes I'll take my time because I'm listening oh that person's asking the wife and she's giving him one price and that person's asking the husband he's just ready for it all to be gone I'm <laughs> gonna ask the husband he's gonna total me up because he's given the better prices or vice versa you know you kind of have to work the work the crowd and see who's really wanting to get rid of stuff and who's being sentimental and uh, pricing it according to their sentiments. That is so true to be an observer first before you start asking any questions and just kind of get a feel for, you know, who's going to work with you on this. Right. (laughs) Good for you. Now your two kids that sell, what kind of things do they sell? Um, well, my daughter just has started in September. Um, her husband has sold for a long time and he does more, mostly sports, um, memorabilia and clothing and shoes. Um, he has a wonderful, um, room, bonus room full of great products and mm-hmm. she, um, quit her teaching job to just take over the, the selling listing and, and getting things out and they're they're doing fine with that. And then, um, my younger son, um, he loves the vintage, um, stuff and he has a really good eye for things. Um, and does he, he'll do the toys. I'll find toys and then make a deal with him because I can't stand to look up action figures and things like that. I, I bought a box for $19 once at the thrift store and I listed some of them and made a few hundred dollars. And then I said, Oh, I just, this just bores me. I, I can't stand doing this. You know, what will you give me? And I don't remember what he gave me or if he ever did, but he sold, (laughs) he sold what I had bought for like 1400. 
he just um, has the patience and and knows that area. So he does mm-hmm. a lot of of that kind of thing as well. Uh, I get that feeling with toys too. Just um, since my my kids are twenty six and twenty eight, so it's been a long time since I've had to know anything about toys. Um, I just don't feel like I'm up on what people want, other than vintage plush. I, I love that category. Um, cause it's, it's just all one thing. You don't, ha- you don't have all these parts, <laughs> right. you don't have all these characters you have to, um, know, like with action figures, you have to know a lot more characters. Um, you know, yeah, there's some of that with plush, but, um, that's just one that I'm surprised. I like it so much because I resisted that for a long time. Like I hear all these people making all this money and I just, I just don't know if I want to learn that, but it's so easy. You just put them in the washing machine. And um, really the hardest part is waiting for the person who wants that specific lovey or, you know, little baby plush or whatever it is. So um, that's really all I look at on the toy aisle or games and puzzles that are sealed right because um i've done i've done the game pieces and puzzles and i just found they sell a whole lot faster if they're sealed because i do not have the time or the desire to work a 2000 piece puzzle to see and then take a picture of it and i admire anybody who does but it, that just i think my head would explode um so I do find them sometimes, the sealed yeah. puzzles. And it's interesting because I don't like that, that piecing out and thinking are all the pieces here and so forth, but I do like organizing. So um, one sale I didn't uh, talk about before at our citywide yard sale this last summer, I bought two, um, they're not tackle boxes, but those boxes that you put like screws and nails, they have the little drawers that you pull mm-hmm. out. I bought mm-hmm. two boxes of those filled with lapel pins, old lapel pins that someone had collected. Mm-hmm. And I talk about paying up. I paid $50 for those two boxes. And um, one of them was mostly full of airplanes and helicopters and that aviation stuff. So I've gone... I've organized everything, but I've actually listed the um, the different airplane pins. And so far, I've made $280, um, and I still have lots to go. I have um, other kinds of pins, um, like sodas and um, football teams and um, bands and things like that. Um, but it's been fun, again, the interaction with people, um, mostly older men, um, because these are, are um, vintage. They're all uh, made in Taiwan, older um, things. And they'll say, do you have a, you know, I don't know my names of but a B-52 that so-and-so flew, and, you know, and I'll, I don't know. Can you tell me more? Well, it has, and this isn't a B-52, but they'll say, I, I'm looking for one that has four engines under the wing with props and and a round nose and <laughs> you know oh they're looking for particular things but it's kind of fun just to um to to piece those out and uh, i i didn't know how to uh, organize i wanted to sell them by lots of course not one at a time and so i put them together in like a dozen on a sheet um, and i did it by color isn't that a woman thing to do here's <laughs> 12 blue planes, 12 green planes. Yeah, yeah like a, a collector is going to say, hey, do you have a pretty blue plane? <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, I've sold, you know, I sell them, you know, typically by the dozen or, or 13 or so. And um, it's been, it's been fun. I've had, had fun doing it. So, well, and you know, the pen collecting and trading was a big deal back in the day. Um, I was a competitive gymnast and we would, we would have pins all over the front of our warm-up jacket and, you know, trade with other teams. And like, you wanted to get all the, you know, all the teams in your area or whatever, you know, it was just a big thing to trade these pins. And, you know, of course, Disney pins and 
um, every category and interest. Um, I found some lapel pins, but they were airlines that are now defunct, mm. like, you know, Pan Am and Eastern yeah. and, um, you know, those are, are collectible and they're only going to get older and more collectible, but what a great small thing to sell. <laughs> it's, it's valuable. It's small. It doesn't take up much room. It's easy to ship. Um, and I do see those sometimes behind the counter at Goodwill, just a Ziploc bag full of mm. those pens. And that is a lot of research going through, unless you're sorting them by topic or, you know, like you've got the right or two pens. Right. I think that that's the key. And it's um, it's something I can do. I call it a TV job. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something I can watch or have, you know, be listening to a podcast or watching YouTube or whatever while I sort because it doesn't take lots of intelligence, just matching mm -hmm. <laughs> and make yeah. sure there's a back on every pin and then, um, you know, punching it into the card and and so forth. So I kind of like to keep busy doing more than one thing at a time. And that's been a good, a good avenue for that desire. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're getting to the end here. Um, I'm changing my last question. So for 2023, the question's going to be, what is your favorite part of selling on eBay? Um, it kind of combines everything. And that is the idea that something that has been discarded um, previously loved, but now discarded is going to find new life in a home or on a person's body or, um, you know, decorating or a new, a new game to play with the family. And just that, that idea that, um, something's not going to be wasted and not going to be thrown in the landfill and going to be loved again. Um, makes it worthwhile while you're sourcing, while you're cleaning, while you're listing, while you're packing. Um, that idea kind of motivates me overall through all the different tasks. I love that perspective. Yeah. That's why my, my shop is called, uh, my store is called New Once More. Mm -hmm. And that's just very motivating to me that um, things can be new again to someone. And well, and I think that your positive energy is going into that item because I think about that too. I'm like, oh, somebody's just going to love this. This is going to be perfect for somebody. Somebody's been looking for this. And I work very hard to keep those kind of thoughts, you know, instead of, oh, when is this going to sell? Or is anybody really going to want this? You know, you really have to watch your, your self talk there. But um, usually it ends up great. And, it was somebody looking for that. I get those types of messages all the time. Oh, I'm so glad you posted this. I've been looking for this for two years. Mm. And, you know, that that's just a feeling that you don't get at a quote, real job. <laughs> you know, being that scavenger, that treasure hunter, and then rehoming something and everybody's happy and everybody's, you know, making money. We're making money. eBay's making money. The post office is making money. The thrift stores are making money. It's like we are an essential cog in that wheel. Um, we're good for the economy. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, okay. Well, what's on your schedule today? Are you, are you going out treasure hunting? I have um, two more out of 13 packages that need to be packed. Excellent. It was been a good weekend. And uh, so I need to take those out to mail them. And I just might slip into a thrift store. We'll mm -hmm. see. <laughs> I still have plenty I could uh, source from my own eBay room, but um, I have been enjoying. Um, I, a lot of times I set a timer. I set my phone timer 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that makes me go to the places I know where I'm likely to find the things I'll pick up instead of browsing the whole store, though I enjoy doing that too. But what can you, it's kind of a challenge. What can you find in 30 minutes? Right. And bring it straight home, list it. How quickly will it sell? That, right. you know, I, I challenge myself sometimes with things like that. 
So, and this week, the last week of December, which we are recording this, is that uh, big donation week for all the people wanting that year end uh, tax receipt. You know, they're taking down their Christmas decorations or cleaning out stuff, and that's just their process. Um, so, thrift stores are about to be overrun with all kinds of goodies for the next few weeks. And I know that some of the Goodwills, they bring in extra uh, tractor trailers to fill up because it's just, it's just overwhelming. Wow. Uh, the amount of donations, maybe not up your way since you're more rural, but um, for the listeners, you know, January is, is a great month. And I think I might need to start a death pile next year because I, I ran out of stuff to list over the Christmas weekend. And um, I was, I got a little nervous. I'm like, Oh my gosh, the thrift stores aren't going to be open again till, till Monday. What am I going to do? <laughs> and so I decided to do nothing to watch movies and eat candy and take naps. <laughs> wow. A real vacation. <laughs> yeah, it kind of was, but it's like now the sun is shining, the thrifting angels are saying, go, go out there and find things. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Well, you might run into my daughter or my son-in-law and uh, they're on the lookout for you because they live okay. in Greenville and uh, so they'll hopefully come up introduce themselves and okay what part oh I just talked to your mom (laughs) what part do they live in are they in the same area of town they live in Greer oh yeah I'm there all the time yeah Mm -hmm. yeah that is a nice little area well it's not little um I love their downtown they've revitalized it Mm -hmm. recently and there's all kinds of cute shops and restaurants so um in the spring that will be that'll be on my list to hit. But um, yeah, I forgot. You said you're, you've lived here in in Greenville. I was born in Greenville and I lived there till I was married. Yeah. Really? Yes. Okay. Um, Can I ask what high school you went to? Sure. I went to Bob Jones Academy. Okay. I know exactly where that is. Mm -hmm. Wow. That is interesting. So you've seen Greenville grow and change and um, very much so. I love downtown Greenville. It's, it's just beautiful with the park and the river. And ha- have you heard about the Grand Bohemian Hotel? I've seen my friend's pictures um, of it, but I have not seen that for myself yet. Well, that's on my list to at least go down there and walk around, maybe get a drink at the bar, whatever. But it is, it is gorgeous. I mean, it overlooks the, the Reedy River and um, yeah, it's, it's the, the newest thing that's open down there. Okay, well, it was great to catch up with you and talk with you. And uh, we will keep looking for your amazing sales on the Facebook group. Thank you. Enjoyed our talk. Okay, me too. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you again, Leilani, for sharing your eBay journey. It was a pleasure to meet you in person. On to today's trivia question. Why is June a big month for weddings? Here are a few seconds to think about it with some entertaining and appropriate music. Okay, this is a little long because there are lots of factors here, but I just thought this was an interesting explanation for the June wedding. The title of this is The Tradition of the June Bride. When it comes to weddings, folklore and superstitions abound. Why is it that June is the most popular month to marry in Western culture? The reasons are many, starting with the most practical of all. If a bride married in June, she was more likely to give birth to her first child in early spring giving her plenty of time to recover before the fall harvest. Many sources say that the tradition of the June Bride actually began in ancient Roman times. The month of June is named for the Roman goddess Juno. Juno, the wife of Jupiter, 
was not only thought of in connection with feminine vitality and fertility and considered a protectress of Roman women, but also considered the equivalent of Hera, the Greek goddess of love and marriage. It is often cited that the popularity of a June wedding in European tradition is because bathing was much less frequent during the Middle Ages than in modern times. During this time period, bathing was thought by many to increase the chance of disease, so nobility tended to only bathe monthly or a few times a year. The peasant class might only bathe once a year, if that often, and that bath usually happened in late spring. So it made sense to marry in June because people would have smelled better for their weddings. Brides also carried bouquets of fragrant herbs and flowers to help keep everything smelling sweet. I mean, can you imagine how bad people must have stunk if they only took a bath once a year? Uh, I'm glad I didn't live back then. <laughs> Another reason for the popularity of June weddings stems from Europe during medieval times. Of course, because Europe was predominantly Christian, a wedding would not have taken place during Lent, which is still true in many modern churches, and the bands have been read over at least three consecutive regular Sunday masses. This meant one had to wait until late spring to marry after the bands had cleared. The bands was an announcement of the intention to marry and an opportunity for anyone to put forward a reason why the marriage may not lawfully take place. Bands were, and still are in some places, read out in the main Sunday service in the parish where the bride lives as well as the church where the groom lived if that is in another parish. Luckily, bathing came into vogue during the 18th century, but the tradition of carrying flowers was carried on, and during the Regency era, brides often wore flowered wreaths on their heads. During the Victorian era, floriography, the cryptological use of various flowers to communicate specific meaning, was gaining popularity in many parts of Europe, and of course, one would want to communicate the correct sentiments for one's wedding. Therefore, it stands to reason that weddings would most commonly take place when the best selection of fresh flowers would be available. The availability of fresh flowers continued influencing the season of weddings until fairly modern times, when flowers became available year-round because of the use of airplanes in shipping. With the idea of locally sourcing fresh flowers coming back into fashion, the idea of a June wedding will not go away anytime soon. Okay, that was really long, but now you know the backstory behind why weddings take place in June. Next week, my guest is Terry, who has nine children. I don't know how you moms with so many kids do it. And she has recently moved from Maryland to Georgia for her full-time regular job. And she is blooming where she's been planted with her eBay business. Okay, that is a wrap for episode number 96. Thank you so much for tuning in and making this podcast part of your week. Happy selling, everybody.